All right, joining me once again here on the Matthew Filipovich Show is my good buddy, Gaius Publius. Gaius is a writer and contributing editor to America Blog, which you can find at americablog.com. You can also follow him on Twitter at Gaius underscore Publius. Gaius, thank you so much for being on the show again. Thank you, Matt. All right, so Gaius, you recently wrote this really thought-provoking piece on neoliberalism and the climate crisis. Now, most listeners are aware of what neoliberalism is and what it means, but if they're not, give them a baseline of what that is and how it actually connects to the climate crisis. Well, neoliberalism is the economic theory. Uh, It's more than a theory. It's what we do in practice. It's what we've done in practice since uh, the Victorian era, with the interruption of Franklin Roosevelt and the socialized uh, regime in Great Britain, then we picked it up again after Thatcher and Reagan sort of kicked it, kicked the FDR regime to the to the side wall. There, um, we're it's a free market practice. It says that uh, it says two things: that markets, meaning economic activity, private economic activity, should not be interfered with by government, and it also says that. The markets are perfect. The invisible hand of the market will make all outcomes optimized. It's sort of a best of all possible worlds theory in which the rich get rich, which of course is the best of all possible worlds for them. That, <laughs> that's the economic theory. It, yeah. it, it relates to climate in that um, that economic theory has a lot to do with people getting their just desserts, and people getting their just desserts is driving us into the ditch. It's driving the car into the wall at a high rate of speed, and when that wall crashes, when that car crashes into the wall, we're going to have a shambles, as we've seen time and time again. In the face of all of these busts that we're seeing in the post-FDR world, we're also seeing a, an increase in the climate crisis, and those two are about to intersect. And where they intersect is the start of a post, uh, a start of a scarcity world, and that's the next economic system as I see it—a world of scarcity. We can have scarcity two ways: we can we can do it to ourselves in order to protect ourselves from climate outcomes, or we can have it done to us by climate chaos and then descend into the post-Holocene world. So uh, yeah, so let's let's uh, let, let's let's delve into this a little bit more because uh, you know. We cover the climate uh, a, a, a great deal on this show. You know, it's the most pressing issue. There, it, it, it's it's something that that you know we you've been on. You know, I think I, I think the last time you were on, we had when you're talking about how we're very close to. Uh, uh, Perhaps probably heading to another mass extinction, which uh, James Hansen said. I th- you know, though, the, if we go another three degrees Celsius, uh, we're going to be having into an extinction land. Where you look at our last two big extinctions, uh, you know, the age of the dinosaurs and the Paleolithic era and all that stuff. So, coming to to that, talk about about the the the, the kind of the concept of. Uh, scarcity, because uh, and how that relates to the climate. I mean, because like it's just like scarcity of resources. What exactly do you mean by that? And, and kind of give us a little more detail when it comes to what you actually are talking about here. Well, well, thank you for bringing that up. The uh, just to clarify, Hansen, Hansen earlier talked about plus three degrees off of the pre-industrial norm temperature for the global average. We're already at plus one of those three. And we're yeah. headed for plus two inevitably. He later wrote that plus two might be too much. But that's a subject for another time. We're, we're pretty close right now to a problem. What about the scarcity thing? Um, if we're going to cure the climate crisis to the degree that it can be cured, we need to go to zero carbon emissions as fast as possible. We, know, we need a Manhattan project. We need a World War II rationing type of project that takes as much of the economic resources as possible from the uh, economy and puts it into a crash course to build out a carbon energy environment. That means that we're going to have energy rationing. It doesn't mean that we're going to have this smooth transition. We're way past the point of a smooth transition. We're going to have to take coal plants offline, for example, without having wind plants replace them. That's, that's the one kind of scarcity that we're going to do. But the, the benefit of that kind of scarcity, if it's an enforced regime, is that when we're done, we've got our man on the moon. When we're done, the Manhattan Project is completed. When we're finished, we're going to be in a post-carbon world in the United States. And with that kind of 
of leadership, the world will be well on its way to a post-carbon world. The other way that we're going to get scarcity has to do with a, a world that has scarcity forced on us because we're having droughts, we're having famines, we're having population uh, moving uh, in various places as they escape economically unviable places. We're going to have social chaos and it's going to be an unmanaged world. There will be scarcity. Water, because water is already scarce. Food, because food will food supplies will, will dwindle, and the ability because to, they're tied they're tied to water because like, you need water for food. So uh, you know that's a you know and, and and species dying out as well. So sorry, go on. Oh, absolutely. They're they're not yeah. only tied to water though, Matt. They're also tied to the ability of the land to actually grow food. For example, yeah. in um, Nebraska and places like that, uh, water abundant water says you can grow corn and less abundant water says you have to grow something else like like soybeans for example in addition if you reduce the if you increase sorry if you reduce the viable growing season that is because you have too much heat by x number of weeks you change the number of uh, plants that you can you can farm in that area ultimately in the north american continent farming will move towards canada as it's already doing so uh, we'll, we'll have those scarcities. We'll live in a post-scarcity world, and we're not going to climb out of it because the, the, the march of climate change, once it's stopped, once it's not able to be stopped, will go to a natural conclusion. And none of us alive will see that natural conclusion. Our great-great-grandchildren will not see that natural conclusion. But those of us who have children, those children will see the first half of the crisis, and they will know that the we're we're now in a different world. They'll watch that transition and they'll suffer through it. I mean, so I, I, just to kind of reiterate the kind of the big, kind of the big idea behind this is that, you know, anyone who believes in science, which hopefully most of our listeners do, realizes that we are fastly heading towards. Uh, we're we're in a climate crisis now, but we are fastly heading towards uh, an area where it, uh, it, the point uh, a point of no return when it comes to things like mass extinction, a point of no return when it comes to things like water shortages, uh, you know, m- you know, all, all the horrible things we talk about on the show, you know, uh, massive repopulation, you know, populations going places, uh, wars, famines, all the kind of kind of stuff, you know, th- that sounds. You know, like we're making this up, but in reality, this is is what's coming when when we when when we go above another degree or two. Um, so that is we we are past the point of doing a, a smooth transition uh, to stop that. So we know. So the the main main concept is that is coming. So we're uh, the fact that we know that this is coming. We have one of two options. One, we do nothing, and, and then eventually the what we'll have is the scarcity that is controlled by the one percent, like they're controlling it now, essentially. But this, but the scarcity will be be controlled by the one percent. The other option is we decide to start the rationing now and do and and do a massive. Uh, you know, building of infrastructure and getting down to zero carbon emissions, down to flat out zero, correct? So those are kind of the two big kind of scenarios that we have facing in front of us uh, when it comes to this. Am, am I kind of getting that mostly correct? You're getting it completely correct. We can we can build out we can build out alternate carbon free energy infrastructure on a crash course. And the good news is that that's actually a choice that we can make. And to, and doing that will mitigate the bulk of the problem that we're going to get if we don't do it. So uh, those those are wonderful choices. I, I I like the idea that we're not past the point of of uh, of no return at least as far as the full the full on climate crisis goes. So yeah, that's exactly right. If if it's if it's strange to think of of a world in which we've got all of this crisis and we're looking out the window and seeing, well, there's snow in D.C., that's a kind of a a gradual or an incremental change. I I wrote more recently than this piece that you're talking about, about a world in which there are climate discontinuities. Look for uh, a discussion of Ice Age in Europe uh, as the title of a blog post that's more recent than this. There will be discontinuities as well. If you want an example of a discontinuity, a, a, a sudden collapse, think about, let's say, we're in the middle of 2015, 
and there's a that that hurricane that went over the, the Philippines, uh, the high end uh, typhoon in the U.S. in the in the Western Hemisphere that called hurricanes. So imagine a high end scale hurricane sweeping through Florida and absolutely wiping out the city of Miami. Miami is a hotbed of development right now. It's hot economically, and the developers are putting their money along the beach. Imagine what happens in within a week or a month in the state of Florida when people realize that Florida development, especially along the south coast, along the Miami coast, is dead. No developer will, will put money there. All of a sudden, property values crater. All of a sudden, the insurance, the ability of, of people to get insurance, flood insurance for that property craters. And there's a mass exodus from Florida of people who will say nobody is going to put money into putting their fingers in the many dikes that will make Miami and South Florida livable again. All of a sudden, people all around the country will say, oh, my God, that could be us. And that's a social collapse. That's a sudden cratering of confidence in the future. And all of a sudden, we're off to the races. People in the Central Valley of California look at the water supply and the vulnerability. That water table is low, and that land is low. Um, if the Central Valley of California floods, they're in trouble, too, because they can't pump that stuff out fast enough. All of a sudden, people look around and say, oh, my God, this could be us. And, and they're in a new world emotionally. And there we are.